some way or we wouldn't all be here. <clears throat> but help us to, to, to know you a little more and to spend some time with you. You know, stay after and, and enjoy a meal with us. There's, there's plenty of food. So with that in mind, we're going to be in Psalms today. In Psalms 127. <clears throat> and for those who know me very well, they know that this is one of the verses or one of the chapters that um, is incorporated in the way that we do our business, it's incorporated into the way that we live our lives. And though it's a short chapter, it, it lays out a lot of truths for us. And the reality is, as we sit here sometimes on a Sunday morning, especially on a dedication Sunday morning, we might say, <clears throat> you know, we're here, we're committed, and, and maybe we, we have brought our children to the church and we kind of handed them off to the church and we sometimes expect our children to ascribe or commit to something that we're not committed to. You see, far too often it is that we, <clears throat> whether it be in the educational system, that we take our children to the schoolhouse and we hand them off and we say, you know, <clears throat> here they are, you educate them, and then when they come home with homework, we're frustrated and angry because we had sent them off to be there all day. They shouldn't have homework. Now, the reality of it is, is, as we learn and we mature, some of us, <clears throat> we recognize that the school is an aid. It's an aid. It's not the end all. It's just an aid. You, in fact, are the end all. The church, the church, loved ones, it's it, just an aid. It's an aid. It's not the end all. If you send your children to church thinking that they're going to ascribe to something that you're not committed to, far too often they don't. Far too often, if it's not in the home, it's not, it's not anywhere else. Now, we have t countless stories and countless testimonies that come from, from bad and horrid situations and circumstances that, that have overcome that. But I think that all of them, if they really look at the core of it, they've overcome that because, because God was present. Because God was available. With that, we don't want our children to commit to something that we are not committed to. And this culture that we live in now has got more of a mentality that somehow worry, worry, when we talk about our children, means I care more. Not true. Not true. Quite often it is that worry means I trust less, not that I care more. And we live our lives concerned with maybe having to put our kids in a glass bubble or, or in a circumstance to where they're never affected by society or society can't get at them. And we create these glass houses by which they are to be looked upon and, and they're supposed to act a certain way or be a certain way or do a certain thing. Yeah, this is coming from a preacher. I got a preacher's kid. We know what the end result is. We know what the, the psychology is behind looking at a preacher's kid and, and what that PK denomination or what normally comes to that reference. It's normally the most rebellious, hellious kid in the building. Amen? You ever went to school with a preacher's kid? I got two of them. Okay. <clears throat> No, the reality is, is they were introduced and ascribed to something <clears throat> that I was committed to. That I was committed to in my life. That, that I didn't force them to be committed to, but I lived it in a way that made it favorable. <clears throat> that made it pleasurable. That made it desirable to choose and to accept that same. And then when they went out into society and they saw a different, they saw another opportunity, 
They saw a circumstance. They had the strength and the wherewithal and the history to say, that's not for me. That's not for me. Now, if we're going to, to raise godly children, it takes a godly man and a godly woman. It takes the commitment of a godly man and a godly woman. And you might say, well, my children are grown. They're still your children. You might say, my children are too far gone. Bless you, Billy. <clears throat> Bring the rain. <clears throat> you know, it says in psychology that our children gain their moral compass by the age of 10. How they guide themselves, how they, how they look at things, and, how, and, and that's probably very true in most circumstances. I know this child didn't really gain his until 20. And I think there's a lot of testimony within the fact that too often it is that we hear maybe statistical research or all those types of dynamics and we allow them to pigeonhole us into a circumstance that keeps us from being able to become all that God <clears throat> intended for us to be. You know, with that thought, I want to read with the, with the mentality of we're here for dedication. I want to read a somewhat of a poem entitled, I Promise. And it's from a father to a daughter. But it could be to a son. It could be to an older son. Could be whatever. So here, I promise my hands will always hold you when you need to be held. And sometimes just hold you because they want to. To guide you in all the choices that you make. To bleed for you, to protect you, and provide for you. To pray for you that you become all God created you to be. To discipline you that you may become a disciplined adult. To hold your hand when you feel unsafe. To open doors for you so that you can succeed. To fight for you and never, never harm you. I promise to be a safe place for you to fail. Never present quitting as desirable. I promise to teach you all that I've been taught and to learn from you. I promise to have dreams for you, high hopes for you, but never let them outweigh the dreams you have for yourself. I promise to strive to define godly character in all that you observe me do and encourage you to do the same. I promise to, to live in a way that helps you hunger and thirst for righteousness and to lead you to the place where you can be filled. I promise to raise your brothers in the same way so that you will know a man of God when you see him. I promise to love your friends just as much as I love you and invest in them being all create God created them to be. I promise to love your mom in front of you in a way that will make you desire to have a husband like hers. I promise to use all the gifts that I've been given, all the gifts that have been given to me to introduce you to Jesus. And on the day you make the choice to give your life to Him, I promise to celebrate with the angels in heaven like only someone who knows the reality and weight of that choice can. Will you celebrate with your children this morning? I promise. C.S. Lewis says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. But if true, it's the... It's of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. He goes on to say, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else.
Psalms 127. Ascribe to, to Solomon. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. What the psalmist is speaking to, for our culture certainly today, is what's the motivation? Because we have a society that's building houses. We have a society that's building cities. But those same societies don't rely on God's provision to do it. They don't focus on, they don't have the motivation that's there. They don't have the, the dynamic of understanding that unless the Lord builds the house, it's labor is labor in vain. If we work and we toil and we put all of those efforts forward and, and, and we do all those dynamics and leave the Lord out, then we might end up with some type of wonderful structure. But that structure will not last for eternity. We can teach our children all the dynamics of the world and, and all the in routes and sometimes how to cheat the system and, and all those different dynamics that we as loving parents try to, to pass on to them and, and instill in them. And we want to teach them the ropes, so to speak. Your child ever told your lie? Right? And you knew it was a lie because it was your lie? Because you told the same thing to your parents? Nobody. <laughs> the truth is, as we go in and we try to navigate this dynamic, we try to, to teach them, but if, if we continually allow the Lord to be left out, it's all, all, that, all that labor is in vain. All that effort is in vain. If we spend so much energy and so much effort disciplining our children away from these choices, away from this circumstance, and, and building a house around them that keeps them out of society and out of an opportunity, at some point in time, they're going to open the front door of that house. And when they open the front door of that house to society, they're going to have no weapons. No weapons to go out into society and to be successful. Too often it is that we spend so much energy and effort trying to teach our kids to add 2 plus 2. How to read. How to balance a checkbook. How to be productive members of society. Clay, are you saying that's not important? Absolutely not. I'm saying though, if all of our energy and our efforts are put forth to that and we leave God out, the labor is in vain. And when I say leave God out, I say leave, leave, leaving an introduction to God because, loved ones, there's a lot of us that are, are perfectly fine with introducing our children to religion. The do's. The, the have-to's. Right? You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to do this. You have to do that. This is how you follow. This is what you sit in the pew, you cross it, and you shut your mouth. Amen? Shut your mouth. <laughs> but this is what we pass on we pass on all, all the dogma of our religion all the can'ts of our religion all the have to's of our religion instead of living in a way before them that they look at that and they say I get to I get to participate in this. I get to participate in that. I get to be a part of the kingdom of God. Not I have to go to church this Sunday. You see, when we focus so much on the discipline of the individual, make no mistake now, I'll, I'll bust that rear end. Make no mistakes. But if all of our attention is the do's and the don'ts of life, we cripple our children from being exactly who God created them to be. And if we think for some reason that we have the plan already worked out for them, and we think that, that our motivations and, and, and our focus 
And our city for them is God's city for them. Then we lose the opportunity of learning from them. Loved ones, anybody who's ever raised a godly child has learned as much as they have taught. Because there's something in the simplicity of a child's mind and the way that they follow God and the way that they'll understand the Scripture with their childlike faith that stumps theologians. That stumps people that are so proud of their knowledge. Right, you've heard it say before, especially from but when we talk about the, the dynamics of the Bible, whether it be the story of David and Goliath and, and, and the kid imagining that circumstance, or, or, or Jonah and the whale, and, and all those dynamics. You, you've heard us talk about it before in, in the scenario of, of, of Jonah being swallowed by the whale. Well, a child has nothing that battles with that. A child can imagine a God big enough. To have, have a methodology, to have, to have a purpose for a person, to, to go to a person and say, this is what I want you to do. They can realize that and they can accept that. They can accept a God big enough that has a purpose. And they can accept a God big enough to allow you to make that choice. And when you make the wrong choice, they can accept a God big enough to create a, a, a fish big enough to swallow a person Amen. to get their attention. Big enough to swim with them in the belly. Big enough to do that. God. Big enough to be able to communicate with him in the belly. A God big enough to do all that. And then when I decided to be obedient, that a whale could spit me out onto shore, and then I could follow through with and see what God has done. A child can grasp that as truth. Guess what, loved ones? It's true. Amen. It's true. But what does intellect do to us? Hmm. Well, let's first research where they said they were. Let's make sure, first and foremost, that these cities existed. This Nineveh. What's Nineveh? Okay, was there a guy named Jonah that's even recorded in anywhere outside of and then in that city, was that city surrounded by another area that, that he could have been called from? And if that's the case, then, then in the direction that he said he went, he said he went the opposite direction. In that opposite direction, is there a body of water? Okay, there's a body of water. Now, is that body of water large enough for there to be a storm that would have caused... Well, did, did, they, have, did they have a vessel large enough? For this story to be true in that day, did they have the technology to build that? Now, with all those things settled, then, then now, is there a body of water large enough to sustain a fish large enough to swallow a man? And if I exhaust this thing, now, is there a body of water large enough that could sustain it so there had to be a fish population enough to sustain a whale that big? Because, of course, the whale wasn't eating men every day, amen? So if I settle all of that in my mind, then, then I have to go into the process of saying, that, okay, well, well, if that's true, then, then, then I guess, it, uh, you know, just by statistical research, I guess there's a one in a million chance that the man fell over into the fish's mouth. and So I'll just give it a, a, a go. One in a million, he fell into the mouth. Now, how is it that the gastronomical juices of the whale's belly did not eat the man alive? And is there truly, logically, in, in, in a whale's belly, I mean, it's pretty large, so is, is there truly, logically, enough air in a whale's belly to sustain a man with oxygen for three days? And if that's the case, then, then, then could a, a work, how did he, how, did, did, did they get cell service down there? <laughs> how did a, a God communicate with, and, and, and how did he get, and then once he got that message, how then did the whale because we know what happens to whales when they get close to shore. And a whale's not going to beach himself, right? And we're so smart. We're so smart. Where a child says, guess what? God said it is. 
Childlike faith. Childlike faith. But the reality of it is, is that we're too smart for that. We're too smart for that. And, and being that we're too smart for that, we've industrialized the nation. We've created things and we've created medicines and we've, we've done all these dynamics. We, we, you know, man-made stuff is just so much better. And Loved ones, there's nothing that's man-made. Nothing. Nothing. You know, I tell a joke sometimes. It's a good preacher joke, so you might like it, you might laugh, you might not. But it's the scientists of this world finally said, you know what? That, that they put a call out to God. And when they put the call out to God, they said, you know, what makes you God? We can do everything that you do. We, 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 can, we can create our own sheep. We can clone them. We can, we can make that. We've even gotten to the place where we can, we can make a human. And God's like, all right, let's, let's give it a try. Let's see. You know, he entertains us sometimes. He says, let me see what you got. Scientists reach down and grabs the dirt, just like Genesis says, formed from the dust of the earth, grabs the dirt, and, and then right before he gets started to, to show God all the things that he's accomplished, God says, oh, hold on, time out. Get your own dirt. Amen. <laughs> you see, though we've assembled things that come together in, in molecular structures and everything else that, that we, we've been gained the knowledge of, all those things are existent here because God created them. And if for some reason evolution becomes successful to explain man all the way back to some dirt, guess what? It's already said it. Amen. But yet, but yet we don't accept it. But we want our children to ascribe to the things that we haven't committed and ascribed to. Do you need an explanation? When it comes to God. Loved ones, the only explanation I need is why, when I was yet a sinner, did he die on the cross for me? And until I can answer that why, I want to do nothing but serve him. That's the biggest why that perplexes me still to this day. Not when I was looking for him. Not when I was reaching out for him. Not when I was saying I am suffering and I need a Savior. Not in that. When I was saying, who are you? I don't need you. Those stories are for children. He died on the cross and said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. They don't comprehend what it is that they're doing. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For He grants sleep to those who He loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Love when somewhere in our society we shifted from children being an asset to children being a liability. But children are a heritage unto the Lord. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman who has children. Offspring are a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Or in some translations, at the city gate. What is he speaking to there? He's speaking to children as an asset, and especially in that day, an asset. You see, when you went in and you went to battle, or you went to war, or you were trying to, and if we, if we, all we have to do is turn it to the National Geographic Channel to get a little bit of this understanding. When we see them spend all their energy and effort trying to form an arrow, just trying to form an arrow of defense, an arrow so that, that, so that they can defend themselves, so that they can gain food, so that they can get those circumstances. If you went into arm, uh, an armed battle, if you went in and you started to battle, and you had two arrows in your quiver, that's one of my arrows hollering. <laughs> but if you went into a battle, you can imagine how empty you would feel if you had everything. Right? The bow, the gear, the quiver, zero arrows. 
How effective is a bow without an arrow? And how effective are you against an opponent with a quiver full of arrows? You see, the children that we raise, and that's where the beauty of that dynamic comes, because this does not only speak to biology. It speaks to children. It speaks to people who look up to you, whether they're 10 years younger or 10 years older. They can become in your quiver. They can become at the gate someone who speaks well of you. They can become the weapon that you move forward with. The problem is, most of the time, what we're doing is we're just trying to make sure it looks like an arrow. And the dynamic of getting an arrow and understanding that how this connects with the message of God and, and how this connects with a sinful lifestyle or coming to the salvation and the saving grace of Jesus Christ is a, is a simple understanding of sin and where the term comes from. Because sin is an archer's term. Okay? Sin is basically they would draw back and they would shoot into the target. And basically you have your bullseye, right? Sin was the distance from the bullseye. The distance from where you're supposed to be. The distance from where you were created to be. The distance from the, the perfect and fundamental will of God is sin. And, and, and in the loved ones, you, as you've heard me say before, it wasn't the distance away from the target that Jesus had to come die for. It's the fact that there was a target at all. Because it's not the amount of sin that needed a Savior. It is the fact of sin that needed a Savior. And then when we come into that dynamic and we start to realize that as we're raising our children, what we're doing is forming arrows. What it is is that we're forming arrows that we're going to shoot out into society to be a, a change, to make change in society. And if we form these arrows with just a slight bend to the left, what happens? We won't even come close, will we? The science of an arrow, <laughs> it doesn't take but just a little. Do you, have you ever seen in the primitive things where you go in and, and you look at how they formed arrows out of sticks? Did, did they ever use a stick with a knot in it to form an arrow? Well, by our, our philosophy, maybe that would be a good thing because it, the knot, we know, we know if we've ever tried to split wood, right? That's some real wood right there, isn't it? Where the knot's at, that's real strong, that's real fundamental. That's real. It, it, but, but if you create an arrow with that knot, it's fundamentally crooked. And when you go to shoot it out into the world, we shoot to the right or to the left. It's because we're not trying to, to come in and form our children into the arrows that God created them to be. You see, blessed is the man who has a quiver full of straight arrows. Because if you have a left bent arrow and a right bent arrow, one with a little up, one with a little down, your chances of hitting the mark, and more importantly, the chances of them hitting the mark that God created for them is slim to nothing. You see, when I go out to battle, God's blessed me, not only with, with Caleb, with with Frank, with Bisha, with Trinity, with Kayla, the children of this church, Sean, Taylor, and Whitney. And you see some of the parents be like, oh, those are my arrows. <laughs> we're in this together. That's what's beautiful. Amen. That's what's beautiful is we're in this together. Those are our arrows that we're forming that we're dedicated to, that we're committed to. <laughs> and when I can see in, in, in one of our children's areas that maybe maybe they could use a little sanding over here, then I can go in and, and, and because, because we're committed to one another and because we're in this together, I can go over there and I can rub up against that a little bit to help straighten, to help get that arrow ready to be shot out into the world. And loved ones, I'm here to tell you, those arrows are from months old, <coughs> many, 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 many months old. The arrows that we're still shaping as the church family are from 85 days to 85 years old. 
But if we're all in this together, we should all be forming and functioning in that type of a dynamic. Straightening our arrows and making sure. There's, there's some arrows that just need to be thrown out and start over with because, because we've got crooked theology. We're trying to build a, 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 on a platform that's crooked already, that can't produce a straight arrow. And our commitment has to be to, to, to do away with and to form in line with, to get truth, so that when we stand at the city gate, we'll be able to contend with the enemy. And you might say, well, well Clay, my children, they're so far gone. So, so crooked. Loved ones, God's got an ability to straighten the mind. Amen. He can straighten the mind. But sometimes if we're so focused on just, just that one crooked arrow, and God has all these other ones over here he's wanting us to, to participate with and be a part of, you know, sometimes we're not willing to do that release which says, God, you got to be God. You know, this one, I can't straighten it. Not you. <laughs> but this one, God, your hands, you're forming. You're, bring the rain, God. Do whatever it takes that they know you. And, 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 and when I release him to God, then I say, God, not, not I released him to you, and whew, I'm done. My kids are raised and gone. They all serve. They start serving all over. My kids are raised and gone. No, that's, that's not. I, I'm, I'm, it means I'm giving this to God so that I can do what God wants me to do. Me specifically. And you see, there's somebody else's crooked arrow that you were created to straighten. That you were created to straighten. And it's not about biology. It's not about biology. It's about choice. It's about, will I serve God in the capacity that He created me to serve? Amen. And if the answer is yes, he's got, he's got plenty of crooked arrows out there that need straightening. Plenty. You see, because at the end of the day, what He's doing as the Father that contends at the gate, He's filling His quiver. He's filling His quiver full of straight arrows to be able to be shot out into the world and hit their mark. Not right, not left. And I don't care how old you are, you still be informed to that straight arrow. If you're willing to. If you would, let's stand as we close out today. I don't want us to miss fundamental truth because we talked about some maybe maybe how society has moved forward and how important progress is and a lot of times you know when you when you speak a message like this and some people say you know, well maybe you're against progress and, and no I'm not against progress I'm not against the scientific method I'm not against learning more and being educated more and moving forward more but the reality of progress and please get this if you get nothing else out of this message the reality of progress is only Progress is only successful if it's headed in the right direction. Amen. If at some point in time you fundamentally recognize that your progress, no matter how far along the line you've gotten, is headed in the wrong direction, then the person who makes the most progress is the one who turns away from that progress. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter how far along the line you've got. The smartest person... The one who's made the most progress is the one who recognizes, man, I've went a long way down this way. Praise God for the reset button. And I can take away that progress and start heading in the right way, in the right direction. Because loved ones, the wrong direction will never, ever, ever get you to the right place. As we close out in song, I pray that you use the altar. There's nothing. It's just it's just made out of wood. I'm not going to zap you up here. I'm not going to make you flop around or fall on your face. But there's something about stepping out of the pew and coming down front that does something for us. It does something for us. You see, you can do. You can pray right where you're at. 
You can surrender to God right where you're at. That's your choice today. You can give all your arrows to God and say, God, my progress has been a little messed up. I want to start over. You can do that right where you are. But there's something about stepping out when it comes to commitment, when it comes to making it real for the individual. There's something about stepping out and coming down front. And God honors that. So my prayer for you is no matter where you're at or no matter what the circumstance is, if God's speaking to you and says, you know what, just come down front, i got a word for you. That you obey that. As we close out in song, that's all I ask is that you're willing to listen. If you hear, will you obey? fellowship with us and thank you for your participation in this dedication morning and pray that God spoke to you in a way that, that makes you think a little bit. Makes you maybe evaluate where you're at. We'll bless the food so feel free to go on over and chow down. Pray with you. Father God, we, we're so grateful. Grateful for the opportunity to come and Thank you for the blessed children that you've given us, God, because they are assets to us. They are a heritage. They're a blessing. They're a gift from you. We thank you for them. Father God, I pray that you lead, guide, and direct us as we try to lead, guide, and direct them to be the straight arrows, God, that you intend for them to be. To help them to accomplish and be all that you created them to be. 
Father God, I pray that if there be someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, but that by some way this morning the message has prompted their heart or touched them in a way that might have some questions, even just, even just a little, just a few, that you give them the confidence to seek after those answers, Father God. Either God come directly to me, I'd, be, I'd love to talk to them, or God seek out in your word just to be obedient to you. Father God, we thank you for the food that's across the way and for the loving hands that prepared it in preparation for this day. We just pray that you bless it to our bodies, God, and God, that we use all the energy that we receive from it to seek after your service for our lives. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank y'all.